Hello and welcome to Treasury Notes, a show dedicated to the latest news and information from the office of West Virginia State Treasurer John Perdue. I'm your host, Gina Joins. Whether it's processing payments for hunting and fishing licenses or tuition for colleges and universities, Treasurer Perdue believes it is his duty to make it easier for people like you to do business with the state of West Virginia. That includes ensuring your money is kept safe from beginning to end. To do that, Treasurer Purdue recently hosted a three-day conference dedicated to educating state workers on how to safely and securely handle cash and other payments. We'll have more on the 2015 Cash Handling Conference coming up. Plus, later in the show, we'll meet one of the conference presenters. His message about fraud prevention is a benefit to all businesses in West Virginia. Speaking of West Virginia businesses, we'll also hear from a West Virginia native who made it her mission to come back to her home state and start what many considered a risky business, a magazine aimed solely at promoting West Virginia. But first, Kim Ward gives us an overview of the State Treasury Cash Handling Conference. Here's more. The more we can touch in the counties and city governments, municipalities, and others throughout state government, the better we'll come in managing money and putting the checks and balances in place and the best practices to take care of the people's money. As State Treasurer John Perdue knows how important it is to make sure the checks and balances add up. He also understands that sometimes you have to make changes to reap the rewards. One thing I like to do is improve things, improve things, make them better, you know. And if we can do that, that pays big dividends. In this case, the change started three years ago when the Treasurer's Office created a handbook for the best practices in cash handling. To continue the change, more than 50 state organizations attended the State Treasury Cash Handling Conference to stay up to date on those best practices. To protect our agency, just to further our education to see and to make sure that we are doing everything as correct as possible. This three-day conference provides state workers with uniform procedures for handling money. And we try to have the internal controls and the checks and balances in place and making sure that all that money is accounted for. But it also offers a unique opportunity to learn about changes in the business, like the introduction of new technology. It's been very informative. Um, I have learned some things that, especially with the Oasis system, that I didn't know that I could do, that is a, makes the Oasis system a better system as far as documentation purposes and that it's recording everything that's needed and plus we don't have to rescan all this information into another system because it's already in the OASIS system. Other financial matters are touched upon as well, like how to recognize and prevent fraud in the workplace. Yes, the person had to be, they had uh, opportunity to rationalization, but were they capable of I couldn't believe the fact that there would be people with the so devious in the ways that they would think or tr have to think to be able to do what they could do as far as double dipping or stealing or skimming and all of those issues. So, Those attending the conference also heard an inspirational presentation from West Virginia native Nikki Bowman about her journey to create a local publishing company during a difficult period in our economy. I'm going to fund it myself. I know it could work. And I had enough money that I could do two issues. So this was the scariest thing I have ever done. It was the biggest gamble, as I mentioned, of my life. Bowman's gamble paid off. The publishing company she started from the ground up is flourishing with publications like West Virginia Living, the lifestyle magazine she dreamed of working for. Of course, at the core of all these sessions, the thing Treasure Purdue most hoped to accomplish was to provide knowledge and education that people can take back and apply in the workplace. Hope that you leave this conference with some important best practices in uh, managing money in state government. Reporting for Treasury Notes, I'm Kim Ward. All right, thanks, Kim. Well, while the cash handling conference was designed to train state workers on the proper procedures for cash handling, there were also several sessions offered to inform people about other problems they may encounter when working in the financial sector of any business. One of the hot topics at the conference and in the news these days is fraud. Treasurer Purdue brought in an expert in that field to the conference to shed some light on how to prevent fraud in the business world. 
Bob Heinzman is a financial crimes investigator for the West Virginia State Police. He joins us here today to talk more about fraud prevention and how you can protect yourself and your business. Bob, thank you so much for joining me here today. Thanks for having me. Well, let's just begin by you telling us a little bit about the work you do as a financial crimes investigator. What does that entail? Sure. The uh, West Virginia State Police for many years has provided troopers and investigators to other state and federal agencies to combat felony crimes that are predominant in the state of West Virginia. Several years ago, uh, the superintendent uh, and his senior staff had recognized that there was a, a lack or a need for a dedicated unit to combat financial crimes. In doing so, he, he was able to find the assets to uh, hire personnel to stand up a financial crimes unit. So in turn, we focus strictly on financial crimes. We can work those crimes independent of other crimes or in conjunction with other underlying crimes in the state. Uh, an example of that would be uh, drug-related offenses. We may be brought in to assist with, with the investigation of drug cases uh, to explore the financial crime avenues of those crimes, or it could be standalone felony crimes dealing with stolen property, such as burglary cases and things of that nature. So we deal with all aspects of, of criminal conduct in West Virginia because most crimes have a financial gain as a motive uh, attached to it. Sure. When we talk about financial fraud and you hear that term, we often also hear the term white-collar crime. Can you give us a basic definition of what constitutes a white-collar crime? Sure. You know, the early definition described white-collar cr crime or white-collar criminals as people of a high social status who would usually, were usually in a position of trust and use their profession or occupation to uh, commit a crime or deceit someone. The more contemporary definition, however, deals with illegal acts that are done for the purpose of obtaining money or goods and usually involve deceit or concealment or some violation of a position of trust. West Virginia is a small state. We have a lot of small businesses here in this state. Is this really a problem in this area, white, white crimes? It is, it is a problem. It's a very serious problem. We, we see more and more of it in the news today. Uh, West Virginia is comprised of m more small businesses than they are large corporations. So the small business is very susceptible to it. One, because they lack the personnel generally to adequately segregate different duties in the business, dealing with accounting functions and records keeping. So they're not able to segregate uh, important duties where we see white collar crimes occurring. Second part to that is many, many times small businesses lack the resources to hire outside accounting firms to help with those accounting functions management, uh, to conduct internal audits and things of that nature. So the small business owner is, is more apt to be the victim of a, a fraud or white collar crime. You know, when we talk about white collar crimes, I want to say no one's really being hurt here. But what you, I mean by that is it's not a violent crime. So, so a lot of people may be surprised to know what some of the punishments are for these white collar crimes. Exactly. And a synonymous term with financial crime would be economic crime. Yeah. So it does have its impact on the economy as well as the individual. In the state of West Virginia, most financial crimes are linked to uh, the felony crime of grand larceny, the theft of property or goods or, or money above the value of $1,000. That grand larceny crime carries a 1 to 10 penitentiary ter term, not less than one year, no more than 10, and up to a $2,500 fine or both if found guilty of that. So most financial crimes, most all financial crimes in West Virginia carry that same uh, sentence, that jail sentence, one to ten up to twenty five hundred dollars and in most cases if found guilty of that the restitution of the stolen property can be uh, court ordered back to the victim as well. Is there a certain type of person or profile that you can typically associate with this type of crime? Well there's two profiles we refer to. We have the original profile and a current profile. Yeah. The original profile of the white collar criminal uh, study had showed us that it was typically a, a white male above the age of 30, college educated, well tied into his community of a high social status, not necessarily of a, uh, not, not necessarily having a criminal background, and very narcissistic in, in his behavior. That was our, our current profile. 
or our original profile, I should say. Has that changed a lot? It has changed. Uh, you know, with the advances of technology, the advances and changes in criminal tactics, and, and then the correlating human behavior changes that have come with that, those things have evolved over time. Fraud in general has evolved over time, and that profile has evolved over time. Yeah, we were really excited to have you at the cash handling conference down at Glade Springs, and you talked a little bit about the fraud triangle. Can you ex and, and you really explained why people commit fraud. Um, we do have those graphics, and we're going to put that graphic up so people can see it. But can you elaborate a little bit more on the why? Why do people commit these crimes? Sure. Uh, the why, when we talk about the why, we're talking about the motive, the motive for the crime. And when we're talking about the motive, we're looking at why that is. And the fraud triangle, that, it, that depicts that why or that motive as a need by the individual who commits the crime. That need is usually a non-shareable financial problem that that person is experiencing. And that can come about from an excessive amount of debt for living beyond one's means. It could come about from an excessive gambling habit. And in some cases, it, it's derivative of drug habits that they're trying to support. So the need is usually a non-shareable problem that that person experiences. And because of that, lots of people ca are capable of committing those types of crimes. Exactly. Um, well, like everything else, fraud has evolved over the years. This triangle, um, would you say it's a little bit outdated? We, we are bringing up another graphic here. It, it's not outdated and it's very, very so much relevant because it provides the initial foundation, the basis for why understanding why people commit fraud mm -hmm. and, and white collar crime. However, with the advances in technology and the evolution uh, of fraud, and there are additional concepts now we have to consider when con dealing with white collar crime. Uh, and that is the fraud diamond. The first graphic depicted the fraud diamond and in that example, a fourth element was added and that was the element of capability. We found that although a person may have a need to commit the crime, may have uh, rationalization or justification to commit the crime and the opportunity, it doesn't necessarily mean they had the capability or ability or the competency or know-how to commit that crime. And then the second uh, sample presented, again, continuing with more recent research uh, back in 2011, we, we look at two different white-collar criminal mindsets, the accidental fraudster uh, the person who had that non-charitable need and has presented the opportunity to commit the crime versus the white-collar criminal who is more predatory in nature, the person that seeks out opportunities to steal. And the common, what's unique about this last graphic is the, the one element that's shared between the two is the element of opportunity. Those two don't change whether it's an accidental fraudster or a predatory fraudster. And that's important to us with doing investigations. It's also important to the small business owner as well as large business and even the individual. It's saying that if you present an opportunity, you present some type of opportunity for someone to commit crime against you, there's a good possibility they may because yeah. that opportunity has to be there. So you want to make sure those opportunities aren't available and you have some fraud prevention procedures in place. If you're exactly. In place. And, and when, dealing with, when talking about the small business owner and business in general, that opportunity equates out to what type of internal controls sure. do you have in place in your business to prevent fraud or any type of theft or crime from occurring. Well, this is a very interesting topic and I do want to talk more with you, Bob, about recognizing and preventing fraud out there. But first, we're going to take a quick break. We will be right back with more. Stay with us. Welcome back to Treasury Notes. I'm your host, Gina Joins. We've been talking today with Bob Heinzman, a financial crimes investigator from the West Virginia State Police. And Bob, we are talking about these different types of fraud and fraud prevention specifically. 
you, um, in your in your speech that you gave at the cash handling conference a few weeks ago, you talked about five common types of fraud. Can you give us a brief outline of those and talk about what they entail? Sure. The and I think there's a, a graphic that you're going to show that shows that table. These are the five most common categories that we see a lot of. And it's not all in ex inclusive. There's many others. But just to give example of those five categories, consumer frauds, financial institution frauds, internet frauds, investment frauds, and senior citizen frauds. And just to grab one quick sample of each, the consumer fraud, most commonly we see today are the sweepstakes or lottery scams. The, the individual receives notice that they've received, uh, they've won a lottery or sweepstakes and they're duped into sending money to help secure those winnings. Uh, those are big. Those, those the, are big around. The they state. are, and, and they're targeted a lot at your elderly population. Uh, an example from the financial institution was the the ATM skimming devices. We we encounter a lot of victims who whose debit cards, credit cards, are they're compromised either at a point of sale, a gas pump, or a cash register, things of that nature. An example from the internet fraud that we do a lot with are the identity theft. We hear more and more about identity theft. The overpayment fraud, we see that a lot with Craigslist type sales, someone selling an item on Craigslist and then receiving payment in excess of what they were asking for and asked to send back the, the difference to the, to the sender. The investment frauds, the most notable one there is the Ponzi schemes. We saw that with, with uh, the Madoff scandal years sure. ago. And then the last category was the senior citizen fraud. We've experienced a, a great increase of those. And with all these types of frauds, more common than not, we find our, our elderly population targeted uh, as victims of these frauds. And of course, West Virginia has a large elderly population, so that's something one of, people want to look out for, um, whether it's them themselves being the victim of a scheme or maybe a family member too. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Well, when it comes to businesses, people commit what is referred to as misappropriation schemes. Explain to us what this means. Talk a little bit more about that. So a misappropriation scheme is generally a scheme against a business. The business is the victim of the crime. Uh, and those, that's nothing more than a theft or, or uh, stolen items belonging to the business. And it's usually conducted by an employee of the business. Um, what are a few ways that these schemes are carried out? Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, and I don't know if you had a list of. I'll I think run we through have a, some graphics. A yeah. through, a, I'll run through a few here, but forged checks. So again, these are these are schemes or misappropriation schemes in which proceeds are obtained by the employees. The first one are the forged checks. These are typically discovered through a bank reconciliation process. Uh, it's, it's during this process, checks are found to who to have been. Forged. Usually, a person who's in a position to has the authority to write these checks will forge those checks. The next one that we addressed at the conference was the altered checks. This is a common misappropriation scheme, not necessarily conducted by the individual who has the ability to write the check, but perhaps someone who can uh, divert the check, mm -hmm. steal the check. These checks generally are altered with correction fluid or eraser markers or some other chemical means. And what they do with these is usually change the, the pay to, the payee of the check and the dollar amount, divert it to themselves or to a friend and change the amount. The next scenario was the billing scheme. And this is usually a, a scheme where billing invoices from third party vendors are, are manipulated. They're altered to show a higher invoice than what was originally sent. And then the difference of that money, of course, would be diverted to the employee involved in the theft. And what's unique about this is there are also employees who will actually go out and set up shell companies, what we call a shell company. It's a fake company. They'll set up fake company, they'll make fake invoices, and they'll actually bill the legitimate business, the, the business victim. And, it, and in times, they'll even set up bank accounts to represent their fake business. Sure. And they'll send these invoices and have payment that appears to be legitimate sent back to them. The next mis misappropriation scheme that we discussed was the cash larceny. And that's simply a larceny of cash or proceeds. That's usually done by an employee who perhaps making a deposit to the bank. They'll, they'll take money or substitute money out of that bank deposit. And the other way they'll do that is actually set up a personal account and de deposit bank checks and cash into their own personal account. The next misappropriation scheme that we addressed was the payroll schemes. 
This could be an employee who's just simply overstating work hours or their overtime hours, or it could be an employee who's in a position to change the rate of pay of themselves or other employees, or they work perhaps in a human resources capacity at the business and are able to set up fictitious employees, what we would call a ghost employee, and then have payroll checks issued to that employee and of course divert those proceeds to themselves. And very quickly we have what two more different types of, of schemes? We have the skimming scheme yeah. which is usually conducted by an employee that works at a point of sale location of the business. That person has identified inadequate controls and they'll divert money at the point of sale. And then the last one was the expense reimbursement. Uh, just the miss, it's the miss uh, submission, submission of false expenses for travel, claim travel related expenses for the business. An employee that goes to a conference perhaps Absolutely. submits bogus receipts to get reimbursed. Very, very interesting. Bob Heinzman, thank you so much for joining us here today. It was great to have you on the show. Sure, thank you. All right. And, uh, we appreciate Bob being here. Bob's session on fraud prevention was well received at the cash handling conference. After all, everyone can benefit from learning to protect themselves and their businesses. But let's face it, fraud can be pretty scary and because it can happen to anyone. Our keynote speaker for an afternoon luncheon wasn't nearly as scary. In fact, Nikki Bowman's presentation about returning to West Virginia and starting her own publishing company was very inspiring. I had the opportunity to sit down with Nikki more about her business. Nikki, thanks so much for joining me. We're so glad to have you here today. I want to just talk a little bit about your story and, and talk about how you started your company and what your, your goals have been since you've taken this company really from nothing to, to something wonderful that all of us in the state will appreciate. Well, I moved back. I'm a native of West Virginia, and I had been gone for about 16 years and worked in the media business, but really wanted to move back and start my own magazine company, and so I did that in 2008. It was absolutely the worst time ever for print. It was in the middle of the recession, so talk about taking a gamble and a risk. Uh, that was the biggest one of my life, for sure. So started in 2008, um, really just me, you know, doing it all, and now we have 15 employees, really grown in eight different publications. That's fantastic. Talk about your specific publications because I know they cater to different audiences. However, your overall goal is to, to market to that um, tourist group, right? Well, it, really our mission of my, my company, which is New South Media, um, is to change perceptions of West Virginia. And not just from people from the outside, but from the inside as well. How do we look at ourselves as West Virginians? So, Many of our publications are more tourism based, but we also, so we have West Virginia Living, West Virginia Weddings, which is really the bridal bible for the state. We affectionately call it that. Um, we have other names for it too. <laughs> We're in our bread, but, um, but it was my bridal bible. It was it? Oh, yes. <laughs> Um, but we also have a business, uh, small, a small business policy magazine called West Virginia Focus. I have Morgantown Magazine that serves North Central West Virginia. And then we have a slew of custom publications uh, that are, um, we did one that's called ID Intel, which is Identification Intelligence Ridge. It was um, a recruitment piece for um, the biotech industry. And then we did, um, we have a brand called Explore. So we have Explore Adventures on the Gorge, Explore Elkin. So a lot of, we cover a lot of territory. You talk about um, just expanding the way people think about West Virginia and improving that image. Uh, West Virginia gets a bad rap a lot of times. And, and I think that it's important that we do um, fight those stereotypes. What has been your experience on that level? Absolutely. You know, I think we, as West Virginians, whether you've been whether you were born here or you chose to live here, um, are the hardest on ourselves. A lot of times, people outside our state uh, don't think about us. You know, they don't know anything about us. So we have kind of a blank slate. But in our mind, we think about all these stereotypes. Of course, we do have uh, sometimes the national press. You know, they hone in on their stereotypes, and it just you know sends me through the roof. And I feel like that's what we're fighting constantly. We're fighting those stereotypes. But for me and for my company, really, our goal is to change how we look at ourselves, how we're vested in West Virginia and how we change, you know, our perceptions of our heritage. I have to ask this question because the magazine business is a very tough business. How do you, how are you so successful? 
how do you make this kind of company work? Because I think it is really working here in the state. You know, I, I think about this a lot, and sometimes, you know, uh, it, it is very hard. There's a lot of work and have a great team uh, behind it. it I, I've been surprised, uh, blown away, really, about how emotionally invested our readers are. And I think that speaks to the pride that they feel in being a West Virginian and in supporting us and what we're trying to do and supporting our mission. So um, a lot of that is, you know, when we have subscribers, they give out 10, 15, 20 gifts as gift subscriptions every Christmas, and it just snowballs, you know. And, uh, and people, people love it, even from people out of state who have no ties to West Virginia, because we're sold in 30 different states outside, even in Canada. We sell out in Canada. So people that are coming, you know, they come down the I-79 corridor, you know, they're driving through the most beautiful scenery that they see on their way to Florida. Yes, yes. So. We definitely have a large tourism base capitalizing on that. Your magazine's doing a great job. And, and they're, they're great. I mean, these are great publications. They're quality publications. I think that um, for a lot of people, that makes a difference. That was really important to me when I was starting out because, you know, when you pick up one of our magazines at West Virginia thing, you, I, I pay a lot for the paper. It's high quality paper. And that was really important to me because I felt like that was your first impression. When you're looking at something and you feel it, you see people kind of rubbing the cover, it's, that's telling them what they're reading is worthy of good paper. And photographs all show up better, you know, um, but it goes against most rules. Most people, like my professors would say, don't blow your wallet on good paper, buy cheap paper, but I didn't listen to that. But it's really important. Well, I think for us here in West Virginia, to see a magazine in your hotel room or on the dentist's office table, um, and to know that it's about West Virginia, but it looks like it could be in a hotel room or in your office, uh, visiting area, I think that's really important. Um, let's talk, let's switch gears a little bit, and, and before we go, I just wanted to talk to you about being a business business owner in West Virginia, Treasurer Purdue, um, talks a lot about being fiscally responsible and is very into small businesses and promoting what we have to offer in the state. Talk about that. I wear many many hats. Not only am I a small business owner, I'm a woman of business owner, and I have publications that champion other businesses. So um, small businesses are always on my mind. I think it's the future of our state. We have to grow those numbers. We have to support them. It's not been without challenges, um, either as a small business owner or as a woman business owner. You know, it's uh, it's one. You know, there are things that you don't even know to ask. The questions you don't know to ask. So. You know, I've learned a lot about the process, and so I hope through our, especially West Virginia Focus magazine, that we're able to help other small businesses overcome some of those obstacles that are starting out. Very well, we appreciate you here. I know you focus on a lot of the different unique things about West Virginia. You are definitely one of those unique things about West Virginia. Thank you, Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And you can find out more about Nikki's magazines at her website, wvliving.com. That's all the time we have today. Thanks for joining us. Remember, you can always get the latest news and information from the State Treasurer's Office. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and our website. Keeping you informed on the Library Television Network, I'm Gina Joins with the Office of West Virginia State Treasurer, John Perdue.